Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this um, closing plenary. Before we kick off uh, this discussion, I would like us to watch a very brief film about the summit. <laughs> We talk from Middle East to Northern Africa and the idea of uh, being able to discuss our experience in Europe with completely a different point of view but at the end uh, uh, sharing the same basic principle of uh, the need to provide prosperity to our own people. What has truly shifted, even more important than the, the political changes that have occurred, is that at the ground level, people feel responsible. They feel a sense of ownership for their country, no longer as observers, but as actors. Turkey actually has been a source of inspiration for what Europe can be if they can enlarge their view and look at the longer term together with the MENA region. Overall, it is like a university campus. People come here such to give you the exact picture where is the world now. Pretty much what everyone agrees at the moment is the preeminent challenge facing the Arab world where issues of youth inclusion, youth employment, all of them have a vested interest in responding creatively and responding seriously and exploring ways of learning from one another. I, over the last couple of days, have made, uh, have had amazing conversations with people that I can't wait to actually take uh, offline, if you will, and continue outside of the confines of the, of the World Economic Forum. Thank you, and uh, please uh, join me in uh, welcoming uh, this distinguished um, um, panel. This has been uh, the World Economic Forum's summit on the Middle East, North Africa, and Eurasia. And we're coming to a close. And this is also uh, our first special meeting for this mega region in our 42 years history. Under the team, Bridging Regions in Transformation, we have addressed the most pressing issues in the region like after the Arab Spring, solving the Eurozone puzzle, the crisis in Syria, the quest for jobs and growth, thriving SMEs, thriving societies, Turkey as a source of inspiration. I would like also then to introduce uh, the distinguished uh, panel. On my right-hand side, we have Ahmed Ayed, Founder and Managing Director, Tyco, Egypt, Global Shaper. Then we have Frederico Curedo, President and Chief Executive Officer, Embraer Brazil, the third largest uh, producer of aircrafts, uh, civilians in the world. Then we have uh, His Excellency, Minister Bagish, Europe Minister uh, for uh, Turkey, and also our uh, distinguished host together with Prime Minister Erdogan. Then we have Madame Guller Sabanchi, Chairman and Managing Director um, in Sabanchi Holding, uh, Turkey. We have Mr. Reki, Chairman Eni, Italy. And we have Muna Abu Salman, Partner, Directions Consultancy, Saudi Arabia, Young Global Leader. Welcome. Mr. Bagish, uh, first on behalf of all the participants and also the World Economic Forum, thank you for your hospitality and also thank you for the great collaboration we have had uh, in the run-up uh, to this meeting. One of the themes or topics that I mentioned was Turkey as a source of inspiration. Is there something like a Turkish model when it comes to growth? Well, Turkey has become a country for inspiration for many others recently. When we look up the 
geography around Turkey were not only a source of inspiration for the countries to our east, but were also a source of inspiration now for the countries to our west as well. We are a source of inspiration to people in Libya, Tunisia, Egypt, Syria, with our democracy, human rights, free market economy, with what we have achieved despite so many similarities like a common culture, common tradition, common value system, common geography. But we are also a source of inspiration to countries in Europe with our growth rate, with our young and dynamic population, with our accessibility to new energy resources and new markets. Countries to our north, for example, an emerging stronger Russia looks at Turkey in terms of supremacy of law as well. Other countries in the region also see Turkey as a source of inspiration. Rather than using the word model or example, I think using the phrase source of inspiration better fits. After all, this city where we were very proud to host the first five continent gathering of World Economic Forum has been a capital of the Roman Empire, capital of the Byzantine Empire, capital of the Ottoman Empire. We were culture capital of Europe in 2010. This year we are the sports capital of Europe. This shows that this city is unique. And naturally, this city where churches, synagogues, and mosques have stood side by side for 800 years can be a source of inspiration to many others. In the course of the summit, uh, we have read in the papers and seen that um, Spain is in, uh, in, in deep uh, trouble. You're also seeing that Euroland and the Euro has its uh, is major challenges. Minister, you said the other day in one of the sessions that you were that you were not so pessimistic. You said that the fundamentals uh, in Europe are not that bad, but it's not about political leadership. Could you elaborate on that? Well, first of all, one analysis we have to make is recently we are hearing new terminology. We're hearing the word brick, we're hearing the word svets, and recently the word guts. None of these include EU member countries. So the opportunities are shifting elsewhere. However, per capita prosperity is still the highest in EU compared to the rest of the world. And when I say per capita prosperity, that includes not only income, but human rights, food quality, ratio of oxygen in the air that we breathe, expectations for future. Therefore, EU is a set of values a club of values. Yes, European Union might be going through a difficult period, but we know from our own experience, 12 years ago, my country had 8,000% interest rates among banks. Mrs. Sabanji's company's net worth could be helped overnight with one wrong decision of the government or one unreasonable fight between a president and a prime minister. But those days are behind us. With stability, and the true fiscal policies of my government, we are now the fastest growing economy in Europe for the last six years in a row. And according to OECD, we will continue to be the fastest growing economy. So if we could do it, European Union member states could do it as well. All it takes is determination and going back to our core values. What established the EU? The need for peace, the need for a common market, the need for cooperation, and the need for fiscal discipline. Many countries were cheating on their numbers that they were presenting to the Commission. And many others knew that, but had to look the other way because of a concept called unanimity. In Europe, all decisions had to be based on unanimity. And in order to get a unanimous vote on every decision, countries started looking the other way on each other's shortcomings. And that created a deficit. That is why country you know best, your own country, Norway, chose not to become a member of EU. But, but since you know, you're one of the few EU ministers in the world, uh, is Turkey still aspiration to become an EU member? Yes, because we don't see EU as an economic union or a political union. We still see EU as a peace project. As a matter of fact, it is the grandest peace project of the history of mankind, as I said on this stage yesterday. If the Brits and the French can live happily together and produce together today, it's because of EU. 
Look at their history. Look at the history between Italy and Germany, Netherlands and Belgium. It's full of bloody wars. If they could put that behind them and establish a union where they can all prosper together, Turkey's membership would only turn this continental peace project into a global one. Therefore, we are still committed to join this peace project. Of course, terms can be negotiated. That's why Turkey is a chief negotiator. <laughs> Mr. Reki, as the chairman of NA, you're also an uh, accomplished uh, negotiator, but you are also seeing, uh, of course, with concern, I guess, the situation now in Euroland and, and, and with, with the Euro. When you hear uh, Minister Bagish uh, talk about uh, his aspirations for Turkey and also for, for Europe, what, what kind of thoughts uh, do you have uh, listening to this? First of all, I share um, with the Minister the view of um, Europe as a place uh, which has uh, values that should have uh, a tangible goodwill that should be put in place in the analysis of this crisis. Still, Europe is the biggest market uh, in the world in terms of GDP, so 28 percent, uh, the U.S. is 23, uh, as a huge population uh, of consumers. So the ex there is no reason, I see, for which Europe uh, should uh, go through this crisis because the fundamental um, uh, imbalances of the world that uh, allow trading of technology to go to developing countries and, and, uh, and technology-rich countries to sell that technology uh, is still there. Nothing has changed. Um, so Europe is leaving a problem of perception, a perception that cannot handle its governance, cannot handle uh, its management capacity. And this perception turning to reality because uh, uh, Europe didn't do anything to correct it in time. And the longer it takes, the deeper uh, this perception turns into a reality which is very difficult to um, come back from. And that's what is the, I would say, the big challenge uh, that uh, the politicians must find. Because uh, you can ask uh, any effort to people, any effort to citizens, or any effort to um, team players in a company when you have to do a turnaround. But uh, people do it if they have a vision uh, of an objective, a vision uh, which makes this effort worthwhile doing. And, and given this vision is the, uh, I think, task of the leaders, uh, either in a company or in politics. And that's what we're all waiting for. That's why I think uh, we have a lot of expectation for the G20 coming uh, in, in the few weeks that is supposed to give some vision. Madame Sabanche, as one of the leading businesswomen in this um, region, uh, Turkey has gone through an incredible economic growth the last decade. 8 to 10 percent every year, created millions of jobs. Do you have any concerns for Turkey in the coming uh, years? And is this a model that could also be exported to, for example, the new democracies uh, in North Africa? First of all, of course, uh, we are all very uh, proud of what, have, what Turkey has achieved. But uh, uh, I am a business person. I always search for excellence. There's always room for improvement. And I don't like when people say, well, we have done our job and it's finished. So it's not finished yet. It is a long road. We, have, we can still uh, improve our, for example, uh, democracy. We can still, there is room for improvement of our gender gap. So there are things that needs to be improved. Uh, and it's good that we have that agenda in front of us to work. Uh, otherwise, it would have been a very dull uh, period for us. But anyhow, it is uh, what Turkey has achieved, as Minister Bash also have put forward. It is uh, uh, Turkey's achievements, and this, uh, the result that we are living through is now is, of course, uh, Turkey have started its uh, democratic journey uh, uh, close to 90 years, secular democratic republic. So. And, uh, of course, uh, all through this journey uh, uh, and the last years, even though I do understand uh, Egemen Bash, Mr. Bash's uh, efforts on Europe, Europe has also, European accession process has helped Turkey of anchoring Turkey in the last decade. To, uh, you know. 
And the, on the other hand, of course, we have heard our prime minister yesterday. It's the, the confidence is very important. Uh, after the crisis we had in 2001, Turkey have learned its lessons. We have a very strong and uh, healthy banking system behind us. We have a, a very consistent and market-oriented, confidence-giving uh, government. Uh, we practically, in the last eight years, we have practically, or ten years, we have the same economy management. So all these things, it's not one thing, but it's all these things are adding up to it. And as a business person, of course, the direction of market economy has always been uh, our, uh, uh, what we achieve uh, and what we look for, uh, and it's continuing in the right direction. So can Turkey be an example? I hope Turkey can shine by example to the region, nothing more. But in order to Turkey continue to be shining as an example to the region, as I said, Turkey has to continue to its progress, to its dynamism in the economy, to uh, improving its functioning democracy, improving its human rights, and improving its gender gap in order to uh, continuously be a soft power in the region. And on, on the gender uh, parity, uh, you think there is a way to go? Of course, there is a way to go. There is a way to go all in all around the world. There is a way to go. We just have been in a panel discussion uh, and on the gender gap. In the last two days, we've been discussing this with different uh, aspects of it. Uh, it is a subject that I always start with my uh, comments saying it's never enough. And I always end up saying we have still room to improve. So there is so much to be done, and, uh, but it is uh, in the right direction. And I must say also, uh, World Economic Forum's gender gap rep report, and that gives us a tool to measure, to continue, and, and the only way we can improve in gender gap is to have really, uh, to measure it and uh, to be determinedly working on it and, and uh, committing ourselves to improving it. Uh, it is a continuous effort by all of us, including men, please. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good point. And I pledge my support. <laughs> Thank you. Another topic is um, the Arab Spring, uh, more than a year after. Um, we know that you, Ahmed Ayed, a uh, global shaper, but also a businessman in Cairo, you were part, taking part in this uh, re revolution that happened uh, in Egypt. Um, what is your reflections now after the first round of the presidential elections, and what are your aspirations for your country and for your region? Thank you, Bergi. I think um, after so many years of uh, oppression, like in, in, in the first time in recent history, we're seeing the people taking charge. They are not expecting any uh, um, guidance from a higher authority or religious guidance. And that in itself is something that we could be very proud of. Uh, of course, things are not very, are not very certain at the moment, but uh, we're hoping that with this sense of ownership that people are having right now, this alone uh, could uh, give us uh, an idea about how things will go and in in, in later on. People are overthrowing these forces that are locking their potential. And especially the youth in the region, they're taking charge. They're taking the lead and changing things around. And that's why like, I'm, I'm hopeful things will be more stable, will be more prosperous, and, um, and, and we'll, we'll only have the time to see. But we cannot only count on the political level. We need to get on the ground and see the change, how to, have, how to help the people on the ground, the youth especially, with their talents. We discovered like, an amazing pool of talents in the Middle East right after the revolution, and then we need to take advantage of that. We need to help the people to rise up to, to their full potential. So uh, there, can, there are uh, 70 million new jobs that have, be, have to be created in the coming decade only in the Arab world mm -hmm. uh, due to the demography. Mm -hmm. 
You think that's going to happen? It has to happen. It has to happen, and people will do it themselves. If not on the on like from from the on the political level, I think we need to do th something about it. Uh, people are taking initiative in the Arab world. They are not waiting for someone to help them, and and they discovered and no, it's not no matter what happens, especially after like these elections in Egypt and in Tunisia and uh, elsewhere, we're discovering that no matter who's in power, things need to change on the ground. The, on the grassroots level, bottom up. It has to happen. Um, uh, Mr. Ayed uh, is saying, uh, Muna Abu uh, Salaiman, uh, humanist and uh, humanist and, uh, and uh, a well-known voice in, in Saudi Arabia. Um, for the Gulf region, uh, you have seen uh, quite substantial economic growth uh, also in the last years, but you also have a lot of young people, more than 50% of your population under 20, uh, 20 years. W where do you see the Gulf region going? Well, there's a lot of complex issues in the Gulf region. We have the unemployment issue. I mean, when we talk about 70 million, obviously that's not the GCC, that is North Africa, the... Uh, Egypt, uh, Morocco, Tunisia. And so the problems in the Arab world are quite different from depending on which uh, area you come from. But for example, one of the things that is happening because it's a complicated uh, issue is that in order to do unemployment, to um, eradicate unemployment, we're looking at education and tweaking of education. But until now, we have not developed a model that actually would lead to jobs. Um, then there's the trend of self-employment. Well, if you do have a lot of self-employment and people do it on their own, you still have to have the government policies that actually encourage it. Otherwise, you'll always be a very small business and you'll not be able to hire people. And so with the self-employment trend, there has to be the government uh, policies that support this. The other problem, and I think this is the bigger problem in the Middle East, or at least in the GCC area, is not just unemployment. It's the idea of ideal citizen. Who is the ideal citizen? How can we create an ideal citizen? How can we, and we call it muatana uh, in Arabic. And that comes from education. And if education becomes, if, if we only care about employment, which is what's happening right now, we're veering away from all the subjects that actually will create a holistic human being. And that's a recipe for disaster in a generation. Because then you have a lot of productive people who do not have enough knowledge, enough um, references to create society. And so again, I go back to this idea of complexity. We solve one problem, but we do not address the rest of it. And we solve one problem not knowing how the impact will happen. Nobody knows. Um, the Minister of Foreign Affairs in, in Turkey said, um, if you don't, uh, if you're unstable, then you're going to stick with the status quo. And there's a lot of instability right now, and we're sticking with the status quo. Um, there's uh, only, I think, one country that has been able to get out of it, which is Tunisia, and it just happens to have had the best educational system in the Arab world in the past you know, 50 years. I think that's the model that we need to look into. Although Turkey is such a beautiful place to be also in. Uh, so um, a second model. Thank Minister Bagish, uh, there are a lot of, um, uh, it's a volatile situation also surrounding uh, Turkey now with the humanitarian situation in, in Syria deteriorating. Uh, we also see that there are challenges still in Iraq uh, Israel-Palestine uh, is, uh, is not uh, moving in the right uh, direction. We also have the question of Iran and, and weapon of mass destruction. Um, what, where do you, what role do you see for Turkey in this, uh, this region? Because you have been uh, stepping up and, and taking more responsibility in your own region the last five years. Well, Turkey has a historical, geographical, and a conscience responsibility. We have a saying in Turkish, if your neighbor's house is on fire, and if you don't help them put it out, that fire will eventually burn your own home. So we have been trying to prevent fires in this neighborhood. We, at times we feel like a fire extinguisher, a firefighter. Turkey has tried and will continue to try to bring means of diplomacy and peaceful solutions to the 
challenges ahead of us. That's why we are trying to bring alternative diplomatic means to the region. This part of the world has seen all kinds of wars, hot wars, cold wars, espionage wars, guerrilla wars, you name it, but not enough diplomacy. And that's what Turkey is trying to do. This is the city where, for the first time, Israeli foreign minister met the Pakistani foreign minister. This is the city where we had shuttle diplomacy between Syrian teams and Israeli teams. This is the city that we brought together the Iranian negotiator along with Ms. Ashton of European Union. We are trying to bring solutions to the problems. And you mentioned the problem. 70 million new jobs are to be created. Well, just if you look at it from the perspective of, oh, we need to find jobs for 70 million people, that might be a scary thought. But if you consider that 70 million people with salaries means a big market, then that gives us a solution by itself. That means we have to internalize the international markets. We have to create jobs, and those people who have the jobs will also be our consumers. European Union today cannot deal with the economic crisis with the current markets within EU, because those markets are mature enough, already maturated. But we need to enlarge the pie so that everyone's slice is larger. Therefore, Syria, we cannot afford to look the other way when one dictator is killing his own innocent people. We have to act. And we have to convince our Russian friends, our Chinese friends, to give a strong message as far as the countries that you mentioned, Tunisia, Libya, Egypt, there are many Muslim leaders today who can go to those countries and pray with the local people. And there are many Western leaders who can go there and talk about merits of secular democracy. But when Turkey's prime minister goes there, he can do both. That's why when he went to Cairo at 2 o'clock in the morning, 20,000 young Egyptians were at the airport to greet him. And when he came out of the mosque, after a Friday prayer in Libya, 30,000 people were gathered to listen to what he has to tell them. Not only because he's a handsome man, because he has achieved what they want to achieve in their countries. He's a democratically elected leader who has been elected for three times in a row with increased margin of votes and has tripled per capita income in, in his own country, has tripled the number of roads, hospitals, schools, airports, and so forth. And that's what makes him popular. And when he speaks after a Friday prayer and tells people not to be afraid of secularism, it has credibility because he himself is a pious believer, but he is running a secular democracy where he has achieved the fastest economic growth in Europe. So when he tells them don't be afraid of secularism, being secular doesn't mean you have to abandon your religion. Quite the contrary, it ensures one to practice his religion of choice as much as they want to practice it. That is a source of relief for those people. It's also a source of relief for European Union member states because they cannot give that message. I think we uh, should now uh, turn to Mr. Corrado. Uh, you're coming uh, from Latin America, brick country of uh, uh, Brazil. Brazil has also had substantial economic growth uh, the last years, but also, of course, also uh, no uh, seeing the slowdown of the of the global economy. When you have been here for two, three days uh, mm -hmm. at the summit, when you're listening to this discussion, um, what is, are your main takeaways from these days? And are you optimistic on behalf of these three regions that we have gathered in this, uh, this summit, at the summit? Yes, uh, well, I have been coming to Turkey for more than a decade, and uh, Whilst there is a big difference, cultural and origin difference between Brazil and South America and, uh, and Turkey, Middle East, there's a remarkable similarity of what Brazil has been doing the last uh, 10 years uh, to Turkey. So uh, when you compare the population, ours is about two and a half times uh, Turkish population, but the income per capita is very similar you know, the, the ability to control its macroeconomy as far as curbing inflation, as far as uh, building up reserves, 
Uh, Turkey, as the Prime Minister mentioned yesterday, or sorry, the day before yesterday, that by sometime next year they're going to pay off all their debts with IMF. Uh, Brazil has done that uh, sometime, uh, some years ago, and now actually is a, is a creditor to, uh, to IMF. So it, it is, it is uh, remarkable to see very distant geographically nations you know, doing similar things, stimulating wealth distribution and growing as a result of that. Uh, I think a key difference between uh, our, our region and, and, uh, and, the, and here, which was very apparent uh, in the last uh, couple of days, is that in South America we talk about a lot of uh, economic integration, uh, some concerns about democracy, but very, very punctually. Uh, overall, the region has done uh, has improved significantly. So when we compare to what to the situation uh, where we are here, you know, we realize that uh, there are really strong concerns. Minister has has said two times the word peace here. Uh, Prime Minister Erdogan also mentioned peace in his speech, and also the word love in his speech. So those are, I think, very very important messages. And for those who live in the regions uh, uh, like, like ours, who have, thanks God, enjoyed a peaceful uh, uh, environment for many, many years, we should not only be grateful, but uh, we should work more towards you know, whatever help can be done. Uh, adding a little bit to, to that point, uh, a, I think there is an increasingly, I think, the unemployment issue, 70 million uh, employees, employment positions that are needed. This is not a local problem, this is a global problem. And uh, I think that we, we're coming to a stage or point where mankind, and uh, the, I'm not an economist, but I think the, 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 the old rule of you have to grow the cake to share it before you share it, I think this is under a absolutely severe question at this stage because I don't think we have the luxury of growing the cake before we are dividing it. I think we have to do it in parallel. So uh, there, this uh, thinking about the national, classic national borders of nations, um, we have to find the ways, and I, I, I think uh, it is hard to find the answers. Uh, lots of was a lot of a lot about it was debated here, but um, how do we keep national autonomy, of course, and sovereignty, and at the same time you reach out to your neighbors or to whoever needs the, needs the help? Because this is not only an economical need, but this is also a human need. The Millennium Goals were set 12 years ago. We're just about three years. From, the, from 2000 to reach 2015. And uh, I think, you know, a lot of the principles, a lot of the objectives which, you know, the world has set to, your, to itself uh, in, back in 2000 are still a long way to go. Uh, just to mention one, the, the, the extinction of extreme poverty and hunger. Unfortunately, we have not made, made much progress. So uh, without further the late thank you. Back to you. What, what I'm hearing you saying is that we shouldn't take it for granted uh, uh, with peace and also stability. What we're uh, seeing is that a prerequisite for growth and prosperity is that we have stability and also uh, yeah. part of that is about integration. Madam Sabanji, uh, you asked for the floor when Minister uh, Baggage was, um, was speaking about all the great results in, uh, uh, in Turkey. Were you then uh, concerned about uh, the increasing uh, deficit or was there something else you had on your mind? No, I just wanted to add what uh, Mr. Bash has said about uh, Turkey's role in the region. I just want to add something there is that, uh, of course, we should be sensitive of, of Turkey's role uh, in the region as to, uh, I think it, it boils down to two dimensions. One is, is as, as I said, is simply being the exemplary one. That being the exemplary one, being the model, brings us a responsibility on Turkey itself also to improve herself 
continuously. That's one thing. And I wanted to add another thing, is the institutional dimension of Turkey can play a role in the region, which already started playing, I think, because Turkey is already a member of a lot of international organizations. Just one of them, of course, Ms. Egemen Bash knows very well, is the Council of Europe, for example. Council of Europe, Turkey has been one of the founding members of Council of Europe, which can help the region on especially consult the region and the uh, developments in the region on democratization. Also, there are institutions, aside of Council of Europe, is the Venice Commission, which can help the, uh, uh, the region and the countries in the region for their developing their constitution. And developing a democratic constitution is, is I think, the, what I hear in the last two days has, is the critical path forward for the region. The, uh, the Tunisians have it working on it. Egypt is a bit far away from that yet. They have to finalize their elections. But it is obvious that there will be an issue of having a democratic constitution within the region on the roadmap will be an issue which for all of us to be concerned and to be supporting, but through the international organizations. That's one thing that I wanted to add to this discussion, and I think it was one of the outcomes, maybe, of the discussions that I have been hearing in the forum. Mr. Uh, Ayed, um, democracy uh, in the region, Egypt, uh, I is would not like yet there, uh, or are you? No, 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 we're way far behind. No, no, we still have a long way to go. Like, we cannot call what's happening in the region right now in Tunisia or in Egypt a democracy. Democracy is not just about elections. Uh, we have a lot of issues. I don't think that anything really happened in Egypt at all. We just had an uprising and we were just trying to get what we, what, what's our own. Uh, but uh, I, and, and the issue of having Turkey as a model, Turkey has worked a lot on itself and that's has been uh, a tremendous effort and they needed that themselves. I don't think that Turkey did that to be a model. They, they had their own issues, they, had, they wanted to help their own people Turkish people, they help themselves. And that's amazing. But I also think that each country in the Middle East has its own uh, characteristics that makes it unique. And each country has to take decisions to, to help themselves and to help their people. So uh, of, I would like to think that Tunisia is able to create its own mo model as, as well as Egypt, as well as uh, Libya. And we'll do that through uh, our collective efforts. I think the role of Turkey, the role that uh, Turkey could be doing uh, uh, with, uh, with countries throughout the region is to give us a more integration, more collaboration, more cooperation. But, um, and, and you've been doing that very successfully, and, and we thank you for that. Uh, but um, stressing too much on the issue that let's have this as a model, it's not really going to work because you cannot impose just one thing on someone and make it work. It has to come from within, and this is the only way it could happen. So uh, th that's, that's my, my own opinion. But Mona, uh, I, I'll, I'll in, before, before I turn thing. to you, Minister, I would like also to get the perspective from the Gulf, and then you can uh, comment on that. Uh, Mona Abu Salaiman, okay. how do you see the Arab Spring seen uh, from your viewpoint and from, from Riyadh and, and Saudi Arabia? Actually, before I answer that, what I wanted to add to Ahmed's point is that as much as we see Turkey being successful, the language barrier for real transmission of models is one of the biggest problems. So for example, if you want um, uh, the public policy makers or the uh, economic development experts from the Arab world who may not speak English to begin with, some of them are you know, mostly Arabic, to go to Turkey and to understand, uh, learn, um, take courses, stay here and come back, which is what we do with the US, what we do with Europe, what we do with each other within uh, the GCC, uh, the language barrier is problematic. So there is that problem with Turkey. As great as it is, uh, once you go beyond the leadership, top leadership level, 
the language uh, becomes an issue. Now, we'll look at the Arab Spring from the GCC point of view, and of course, it's not, I mean, it's quite obvious that the GCC panicked when the Arab Spring occurred because uh, youth uprising uh, from a cultural point of view, where we respect the elders, was difficult to um, comprehend. Um, the other point is that, which was even more problematic, that not much leadership emerged from the revolutionaries. So it became a lot of different, they wanted change. But until now, for example, if you look at the revolutionary um, candidates who almost scored nothing um, in, in the elections, uh, it showed that they did not coalesce on their demands and present uh, a united front. And that is very scary for the GCC. If, um, do, you, do you agree on that, Ahmed? Not entirely, of course. Is it working? <laughs> yeah, is it working? I'm telling you from the GCC point of, of view. Of course, of course. <laughs> but to say that the uprisings haven't done anything to the countries that had No, no, that no, I, I'm not saying, I'm saying there was, there's no apparent leadership with it. Of and course. that's what you take pride in, is that it was yeah. a mass movement. It, it is. And, and right now, there are actually a, a lot of leader figures are, are emerging because of the elections. Now people have given votes to people, and now they are being held accountable to those who voted for them. So yes, in the beginning, there, were, there was no clear... Uh, it's between uh, the MP and Ahmed Shafi. It's true, but look at Tahrir Square right now. Look at the news and see what's going on in Tahrir. People are still taking the lead. Work in progress. <laughs> uh, progress. Who said it's going to happen overnight? It's, it's a long-term long -term struggle, but it's, we're going there. Look Inshallah. at Brazil. Look at like, Latin America 20 years ago. Look at Turkey 70 years ago. It's not, it's not going to happen overnight. So, and we've been in this, like in the Middle East, it's a very complicated region. And we have so many uh, factors that affect this issue. But right now, the most important thing is that this taboo has been broken. The people have spoken and they're not going to be silent. And they're taking the lead. And that's what's important right now. Yes, it's going to be struggle. Yes, it's going to be very hectic. But we're willing to do it. Let's do it. Help us to do it. This is all that we're looking for. Right. So we're, we're, wait, we're waiting for you to give us your, uh, your, your let's say, your uh, example. Thank you. Mr. Bagesh, do you still want to comment? I, I wanted to interfere when Ahmed spoke for the first time to mention that I agree with him. Democracy is not a one-size-fits-all sock or glove. No. Every country has their own tradition, history, culture, which needs to be embraced into the making of their democracy. But one thing is for sure. Every nation deserves democracy. Exactly. And all nations who have tasted the great taste of democracy don't want to give it up. And we have to help them make their own democracy. That's why I constantly, and I think Ms. Sabanji agrees with me, try to change the phrase from example or model into source of inspiration. Turkey has great achievements in the last 200 years where we tried to coexist culture of Islam with culture of democracy, but unfortunately we have also made some huge mistakes. I am not proud of the fact that there was a military coup in my country in 1960, which ended up executing an elected prime minister with two of his top cabinet members. There is also a lesson to be drawn from that mistake that they shouldn't make. That's why there is no capital punishment today in Turkey, because we're trying to learn from those who switched to democracy before us. But a country like Spain had lieutenant colonels taking their parliamentarians hostage not 100 years ago, 40 years ago. They had a very difficult democracy, and now they are still in the process of making it. We seem to be a source of inspiration, but we're still working on our constitution. We still have issues to deal with in Turkey. That's why when Ms. Sabanja says we have to work on gender parity, I agree with her, and we're trying our best. But if you look at the Turkish universities today, you can be really hopeful, because there's greater room for female students today, and most of the graduates happen to be females compared to the past when it was predominantly males. 
So I am hopeful that Turkey is working on her challenges, and we can only share our experiences with countries who want to withdraw, draw lessons from our experiences, in good way or bad way. Uh, Muna uh, Abu Salaman, you have also worked a lot on, on gender in, in Saudi Arabia, and you have frequently been uh, raising this issue of a glass ceiling. Uh, could you comment on, on this discussion about gender and what yeah. Minister Bagish just said? Well, I have to admit the World Economic uh, Forum Gender Parity Report has been very successful pointing out a lot of the problems within many countries. The issue is that in order to um, circumvent uh, negative uh, you know, um, rankings is that people would elect um, a token person. So you'd have one or two people in parliament or one member of the cabinet. Um, and you do not achieve the numbers that really would um, be sim symbolize a real change in the system or real progress. And so, of course, in the GCC, we have those token women. Uh, in some countries stronger than others. Even in Saudi Arabia now, we're going to have women in the Majlis al-Shura, we have women in the uh, King's Selection Council, we have women who are going to be voting and voted for in the municipalities. But does that translate to um, a more just and dignified future for most of Arab women? Um, and it hasn't translated to that yet. And we look into the struggles of the U.S., where it's only 17% of women in the U.S. in Congress. Um, you look at the Fortune 500 co um, companies and how many of them are led by women or have uh, women in the top executive management. So it's an issue that affects everywhere in the world. And as I said, people circumvent it by um, doing superficial things. Now, the Thank problem you. in the Arab world that Islam and culture um, are being used as the way to tell women what they should or shouldn't do, and they're guilt-tripped into giving up a lot of their ambitions. This is not going to go away anytime soon. So what I've always suggested, and I've um, done this in several talks, is that it's not about reformation of the system. It's about changing the system. And so how do you actually look at motherhood, which is the real reason women are being excluded from a lot of... Um, uh, pathways that lead to the top. How can you look at motherhood as parenting versus motherhood? And then whatever the burden of society that mothers, so if you're taking flexible time, if you're taking time off, maternity leave, how do we translate that into something that both male and females um, actually carry? Uh, so I'll give an example. In the U.S., they say women get 70% to a dollar for each, you know, for each dollar um, that a man makes. And how can we make it 85% for both? Um, saying that it is not really about motherhood, it's about raising successful, healthy uh, children for a better society, and it doesn't become just motherhood. So it's reframing the, the story and changing the system versus just patching it up, which is what we've been doing so far. Thank you. Um, I don't think we could uh, end this uh, without also addressing some of the growth enablers uh, that are important in the regions. And uh, the last days, uh, there's been also focus on energy. Energy uh, being a prerequisite for economic growth. There is a growing energy demand in the region. And uh, having uh, you, Mr. Reki, here on the panel, I know you care a lot about energy corridors and also pipelines so we can secure also energy um, access. What, what are the main takes from this uh, summit on this topic? I would say that the key word of the summit has been around links, and uh, so the, the summit has assesses that are links between everything, uh, between uh, economic powers, between political leaders, and uh, between areas of the world. And links uh, uh, also are the key factor for energy now, because the new uh, rule of the game is, is uh, not being anymore in the traditional world of consumer and producer. So there was a, a stable world of energy where um, countries rich of resources were selling these resources to countries that were consuming them. Um, now there is a, a big discontinuity on the market because the uh, technology has uh, brought 
a lot of new uh, way of running this, uh, this business. Uh, there is a revolution of gas going on, uh, which is due to the technology for um, those of the industries well known, the shale gas, which has transformed the United States from a net importer into a net exporter of gas so far. And this is changing the dynamic in a, such a strong way. Uh, we have uh, market prices which go from $2 million BTU in the U.S. Uh, to $10 million BTU in Europe to $15 to $18 in Asia. So it's such a huge arbitrage uh, which uh, will cause a realignment and rebalance uh, between the use of gas and oil because uh, soon this transformation won't be limited only to the energy producers but will probably be spread around uh, other industries like transportation, like um, other ways that we consume um, the hydrocarbons. So uh, corridors become uh, the, the game changer because securing the resources, um, building the highways for these resources to come to your market uh, is going to be the new um, security gain for uh, access to energy. And, uh, and uh, there is a, a huge dynamic of Far East countries, for example, building new infrastructures such to change the negotiating power that they had before and, uh, and, and get into the game that was a, a stable game before. Mr. Corredo, um, you heard um, a discussion about uh, democracies, new democracies. Your country have been through uh, a transition um, from dictatorship also to quite substantial economic uh, growth. You're looking at uh, the growth enablers in this uh, region. Um, are you, after these two days, are you optimistic, more optimistic on behalf of the region? Are you uh, looking more for, for future investments uh, here? I think uh, one has to be optimistic. It has to be. And uh, I fully agree with Ahmed. You know, democracy is not something that happens overnight. Uh, it is a learning process. You have to use it and reuse it. And the basis is education. And many people talk about education, but the reality is that that is the real basis for any democratic state. So uh, one has to be, has to be uh, um, uh, optimistic, and I think the amount of energy and uh, willingness of people to change that caused the Arab Spring is not a simple fact. I don't think it's something trivial. So I think that collective consciousness that really, you know, make people, you know, change uh, uh, their, their behavior, go against maybe a... Uh, culture and do something different. Uh, it's 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 it's, uh, it's something to be uh, to be uh, optimistic about. Is that going to be resolved very soon? I don't think so. But uh, humans learn. Thank you, Minister Baggish. We're coming uh, to a close. We started to work on this summit uh, last summer. Uh, we have. Uh, uh, work closely uh, together on the topics and, and uh, also to, to make this uh, historic in the sense that there are uh, bridging uh, three or four regions. Um, what are, you know, when you've been through the summit now and we are here at the close, what, what are for you the highlights? What, what are the, uh, the, the key big ideas that came out of this? I think it was a historic meeting, not only because it was the first time that 1,100 participants from 70 countries, around 180 CEOs and 50 top government representatives came together, but also this meeting took place right before the G20 summit and before the sustainability summit in Brazil, where many world leaders will try to find solutions to our common challenges. And right now, the butterfly effect is more evident than it ever was. No country is safe until everybody is safe. No country is rich until everyone else feels comfortable. We are all affected with each other. Nobody has the right to say, oh, it's another problem in some other part of the world, and I don't care. Because we're all affected with each other's resources, problems, wars, floods, opportunities, gains and so forth. So Istanbul gave us a chance to flourish some ideas. 
and those ideas will shed light to the world leaders who will gather in Mexico and Brazil to find concrete solutions. And as a proud representative of Istanbul, I'm very honored that we had this preparation meeting for world leaders here in my own city, where continents and cultures and civilizations have coexisted and merged together. And therefore, I'm happy that what started back in August, when Dr. Schwab came to Prime Minister Erdogan and said, Mr. Prime Minister, I understand you're not coming to Davos, but we're planning to bring Davos to you. And he said, whoever comes, it's a part of our tradition to welcome our guests. You are more than welcome. And we started working with our friends, with Stephen, with Borge, and everyone else. And I'm very happy that we have done a fine job. And I'm looking forward to the repetition of this. Yeah. And welcome to Davos, Minister. I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um... Thank you so much uh, to the panel for the, the rich uh, discussion. I just want to thank uh, the World Economic Forum and Dr. Schwab in particular for like, giving us the opportunity as global shapers to actually speak. We're usually not very represented, so I thank you for that. And I just give him a big round of applause. Thank you. And Borch, thank you. Tip O'Neill. Tip O'Neill once said, all politics is local. Yeah. So I have a call and urge to all the participants, after the reception tonight and all day tomorrow, go do your shopping here in Istanbul and tell the merchants that you're my friends. <laughs> you know that um, Tip O'Neill, the former speaker of the, of the host, he, he's also known for another story when he came back. Uh, from the, the Congress, came to his old father in Boston, and uh, he became the Speaker of the House, the third most important position uh, in U.S. Uh, politics. And the father said to uh, Tip O'Neill, my son, remember, it's nice to be important, but it's more important to be nice. I think that is also um, a very wise uh, advice. Thank you uh, to uh, the panel. Thank you also to our, the young voices of our new community at the World Economic Forum, the young shapers between 20 and 30, representing more than the 50% of the population under 27 years um, globally. Those voices are needed. Thank you so much to the distinguished participants. You have been great. And see you at the reception, farewell reception, down at the swimming pool. Thank you so much. <laughs>